This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Garib, funded in part by TheStreet.com and Action Alerts Plus, where Jim Cramer and fellow portfolio manager Stephanie Link share their investment strategies, stock picks, and market insights. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR. Strong year for stocks. Investors closed the books on 2014 with another year of gains, despite today's triple-digit decline for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. January effect. Are stocks a good buy at the start of the new year? We have the names that have historically done well when the calendar changes. And pay raise. Why millions of workers will ring in 2015 with a little bit more money in their pockets. We have all that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this last day of 2014, Wednesday, December 31st. Good evening, everyone, on this New Year's Eve. I'm Susie Garrow. And I'm Bill Griffith in tonight for Tyler Matheson. Once again, no champagne rally on Wall Street today. All the major averages sold off on the last trading day of the year, but it was another banner year for stocks. The blue chip index managed to record its sixth consecutive year of gains despite falling in today's final session of the year. The Dow Jones Industrial Average tacked on 38 uh, record closes this year. The S&P 500 posted 54 new highs, helped by an improving economy and accommodative Federal Reserve. So on this last day of 2014, here's how the major averages closed, with the Dow falling 160 points, the Nasdaq down 41, and the S&P dropping 21 points. But here's the good news and why many investors are celebrating today. The yearly performance of the major stock market averages was pretty amazing. The Dow blue chip average rose 7.5%, the Nasdaq up 13%, and the S&P gained 11%, its third straight year of gains. As for bonds, many predicted yields would rise this year. But the 10-year yield finished at 2.17%. That's the biggest yearly drop since 2011. Now, while utilities and health care were the top performing sectors, the best performing stock was Southwest, up almost 125 percent. And the global market that outperformed all others is an unlikely one. Argentina, up almost 60 percent, and that's despite battling a debt default and currency crisis. And, of course, you cannot talk about 2014 without discussing the biggest surprise of the year, energy, which was the worst performing sector. Crude oil saw its biggest annual decline since 2008, falling by nearly 46 percent, coming under further pressure today again on weak data out of China, ending the year at $53.27 a barrel. The trend is the same for Brent North Sea crude, which finished 2014 at $57.33, down 48 percent for the year. Jackie DeAngelis takes a look now at sentiment in the energy market as we head into 2015 and the possible wild card that's emerging in that sector. Crude oil took a wild ride in 2014, down nearly 50 percent on the year, a plunge no one saw coming. It took me a little bit by surprise, but once we broke key levels on a weekly chart and on monthly charts and you saw that room down below and knowing what happened in the past, you did see it coming after it broke those key levels. The reasons? U.S. shale production boomed with domestic oil production over 9 million barrels a day, closing in on Saudi Arabia, the world's largest oil exporter. But the demand just wasn't there. Weakness in China, Japan and the Eurozone took markets by surprise, and with a backdrop of rising supply, the market got crushed. So what does the future hold for crude prices? Well, if OPEC stands firm and doesn't cut production, U.S. shale producers will have to. But the question is, how low do we go before that happens? I think first half of the year is much of the same. Maybe not as much of a violent sell-off as, as, as you've seen in the past, but it still looks very bearish. And I don't see there being any cuts by the OPEC members. I don't see why they changed their tune now. The good news? Falling energy prices helped consumers. The national average for a gallon of regular gas, $2.26 today, according to AAA, down $1.06 from this time last year. Many cities seeing gas prices under $2, and Oklahoma and Missouri seeing their state averages under that level. The total savings, $14 billion this year. What are the wild cards that could impact pricing next year, aside from supply-demand dynamics? 
Well, geopolitical strife is one. A changing of the guard in Saudi Arabia as the king is facing health issues is another. And then, of course, there's the rising dollar. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. Well, within energy, the worst performing stocks this year were oil and gas producers and drillers. Take a look at these numbers. Transocean lost 63 percent. Denbury Resources fell 50 percent. Noble and Ensco both off about 48 percent. And Range Resources dropped 36 percent. Now to the biggest loser in the Dow Jones Industrial Average in 2014, that would be IBM. Big Blue, battered and bruised this year, losing 15 percent of its value. What plagued the company and where does that stock head from here? Josh Lipton has our story tonight. As the year closes and we go into next year, hardware will be less than 10% of the IBM company. Really? IBM's we'll CEO, Ginny Rometty, says that IBM has to reinvent itself as it has in the past. But will investors wait around to see if this transformation actually works? IBM's shares dropped hard this year. In fact, IBM was the worst performer in the Dow. One knock on Big Blue is that the company initially missed just how disruptive cloud technology would be to its traditional businesses. You have these small cloud players that don't have and don't need a lot of infrastructure and can offer a solution that costs a whole lot less, that can come in more quickly. Uh, I think IBM, not to say was blindsided, but yeah, they really were caught off guard. But Remedy is now changing course at IBM by growing that cloud business organically, as well as by making acquisitions. IBM now expects to generate at least $7 billion in cloud revenue by 2015. IBM bulls point to other reasons for optimism as well. They say that the stock isn't expensive and that the number of analysts on Wall Street rating IBM a buy is at a 20-year low, a possible contrarian indicator. IBM is an iconic global brand, which has reinvented itself in the past. The question now is whether Remedy can execute another transformation at Big Blue. If not, she risks another disappointing year for her shareholders. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton in Silicon Valley. Every year at this time, investors ask a common question. Are stocks a good buy in January? It's the so-called January effect that says stocks go up at the beginning of the year because investors want to start buying again. So which names tend to do well? Morgan Brennan digs through the data. Forget those New Year's resolutions to quit smoking or eat healthier. How about one for your investment portfolio? A stock detox. Over the past decade, certain names have tended to pop in the first two weeks of a new calendar year. According to data from market analytics firm Kensho, those stocks have overwhelmingly been medical device makers. Stryker has averaged a 5% gain, Zimmer Holdings and Edwards Life Sciences 3% apiece. 2014 was good to this healthcare industry and analysts expect that to continue in 2015. Next year, I think it's going to continue to be about M&A. We're going to have three deals closing in the first quarter. Uh, so that will really now change it from the hopes of what could happen with M&A to really uh, putting some numbers down in the record and really executing on a lot of the plans on the integration side and really starting to see the benefits of these mergers come together. Medical device makers may be worth a look, but think twice about certain retailers. According to past performance, at least, GameStop, L Brands, and Kohl's have all tended to slump in early January, thanks in part, say analysts, to holiday sales data. Telecom companies also tend to fare poorly at the start of a new year. CenturyLink has tumbled 3% on average over the past decade, while Frontier Communications and AT&T usually fall 3% as well. But keep in mind how stocks fare in January doesn't always serve as a good indicator for the rest of the year, contrary to the so-called January barometer theory. This year, the S&P 500 slid lower in the first month, but it's ending 2014 12% higher. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan, wishing everyone a happy new year from the NASDAQ in New York City. And there are three big themes that investors need to keep a close eye on in the new year. Dominic Chu now has that part of the story. The stock market did rally in 2014, but not by as much as it did the year before. And investors are dealing with a host of uncertainties as we head into the new year. One of the biggest concerns comes via the energy sector. Falling oil prices have helped consumers save lots of money at the pump. 
but reduced spending by oil companies themselves is a big risk. It's not all positive. There's certainly going to be uh, on earnings and different uh, impacts on the market that are not quite so positive for 2015 from the oil and gas business. Then there's uncertainty about if and when the Federal Reserve will move to change interest rate policy. Low rates have arguably been fueling much of the recovery in the stock market and broader economy. That uncertainty has some money managers on edge. We don't know when the Fed will raise rates. Um, you could you know, it's hard to see interest rates going any lower, but the exact timing of that can be very difficult. And when it does occur, it can occur relatively quickly. And of course, we operate in a global economy where issues outside the U.S. have repercussions within our borders. There's always the potential with something with Russia or tensions increasing with China or something like that impacting the global economy. Um, but I would say it's always the things that you are least worried about that actually could be the biggest risk from a geopolitical standpoint. It's due to risks like these that lead some experts to exercise caution and patience when it comes to investing in the new year. Just because your friends made a lot of, you know, 20 percent in the stock market in the last couple of years doesn't mean you have to go all in. Sit in the boat, wait for some fear, and that's your best entry point. After six straight years of gains for the Dow Industrials, many investors are paying closer attention to the unknowns in the market and coming to grips with just how much appetite for risk they have. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. Let's turn now to Patricia Edwards and get her market outlook for the year. She's Managing Director of Investments at U.S. Bank Wealth Management. Happy New Year, Patty. Nice to have you with us. Happy New Year, Susie. Glad to be here. Well, give us your outlook uh, for 2015. And are you changing your investment strategy? You know, we're not changing our investment strategy at all right now. What we're looking for in 2015 is an S&P target of 2240, which is a little over 10 percent from here. You add in dividends, you're looking at about a 12 percent year. For the last, I don't know how many years, Patty, there's been the forecast that the bull market in bonds was over, that interest rates were going to rise, and it hasn't happened yet. Will it happen in 2015, especially if the Fed starts to raise rates? So the Fed has been easing off. We know that we had a tape, taper tantrum. We expect that maybe we'll have a little bit of a taper tantrum part due um, in 2015 when they actually do start to rise. But we believe that they are going to start to raise rates probably in the June time frame, maybe a little bit later than that. Of course, it's all data dependent. Janet Yellen's been telling us and that. And what does that do to the 10-year yield? And that's the one that benchmarks the mortgage rates out there. What do you think will happen? Well, we're looking for the 10-year to get up to about 3 percent by the end of the year. Now, once again, data dependent, it could be 275, it could be 3 percent, but we really do think that the rates are going to go. And it's mostly because we're seeing good, strong wage growth, we're seeing the um, inflation being under control, and we think there's going to be capital expenditure. All right. So a lot of people, as you heard in our last report, you know, when it comes to January, one of the resolutions is to put some of their savings and some of their money in the markets. What advice can you give of where are good places to put your money in the new year and then come out OK by next year at this time? All right. So our themes, we're looking for capital expenditure. That would lead us toward the industrials. You know that the consumer has got more money in their pocket. That would lead us toward consumer discretionary. You know that interest rates, or we at least believe interest rates are going up. That would actually lead us toward the financial sector. And then look at the energy sector. You want to be really careful here, but we think that the baby has been thrown out with the bathwater on a lot of these names, and that you can very selectively look at some of those names also. A lot of our uh, audience will be income-oriented, and in fact, uh, one of the big income-oriented sectors, the utility stocks, were the best performing sector in 2014, which is kind of a surprise, actually. Do you expect that to happen? And where would you invest for income right now? Well, there's a couple of things I'd be looking for. Um, the utility sector doing as well as it did is really a surprise. I wouldn't necessarily bank on that happening next year. We'd be looking for dividend growth rather than high dividend yields. We think the companies that are growing their dividends on a sustainable basis are probably a better place to go. So look at somebody who's been raising their rates, their dividend rates for a, a sustainable period of time. Um, beyond that, you might also look at the REITs. Um, they are actually becoming their own sector probably in March of 2015. And with that, you've got indexers that are going to have to get into mm -hmm. that space. All right. Lots of good information. Thank you so much, Patty. Patricia Edwards at U.S. Bank Wealth Thank you. Management.
Now to the economy. More people filed for first-time jobless benefits last week, although those figures are still near post-recession lows. Claims rose by 17,000 to 298,000, more than expected, but the four-week moving average was virtually unchanged. And the housing market remains sluggish. The National Association of Realtors says pending home sales, now these are contracts that are actually signed to buy previously owned homes, they rose moderately in the month of November by 0.8 percent. And for the year, signed contracts rose 4 percent. This is despite continuing low mortgage rates. Freddie Mac says the 30-year loan rate is 3.87 percent this week. That's slightly higher than last week, but still near the lows for 2014. Still ahead, why our market monitor guest tonight says financials and technology are the places to invest in 2015. But first, a look at some stocks that doubled this year. Twenty fourteen has not been kind to PIMCO's flagship total return fund. Preliminary data from Morningstar shows the world's largest bond fund trailed most of its peers after a difficult year for PIMCO. The fund rose four point three percent behind seventy seven percent of its peers. But the gain was a rebound from the fund's loss in twenty thirteen. And you'll remember that PIMCO's two star managers, Mohammed El Arian and founder Bill Gross, both left earlier this year, prompting a wave of outflows from nervous investors. Well, some of the lowest paid workers in our country will have a little something to celebrate as 2015 begins. Kate Rogers has the details. Across the country, many workers will be ringing in the new year with a raise. Beginning on January 1st, 10 states will see increases to their minimum wage rates, thanks in part to ballot measures passed in midterm elections. Another nine get hikes due to annual cost of living increases. New York's raise kicks in today, and Alaska's minimum wage increase, which passed during midterms, will kick in on February 24th. The current federal minimum wage is at $7.25 an hour, but the national average minimum wage after these hikes kick in will be around $7.75 an hour. With higher wages comes more pressure on not just small businesses, but franchisees. There are more than 770,000 franchise establishments and 18 million employees nationwide working for franchises, according to the International Franchise Association. The IFA says more than 85 percent of their members believe that recent efforts by some cities and states to increase the minimum wage will negatively impact their business. Franchisees may be tied to big corporate names like McDonald's and Subway, but often operate as smaller storefronts owned by individuals. Fast food franchises in particular have been caught in the crosshairs of the national minimum wage debate as workers nationwide have been striking for $15 an hour. Critics say minimum wage hikes will lead to job cuts and higher costs for consumers. But Christian Weller from the Center for American Progress says franchisees can actually benefit. I think they need to take a deep breath. Um, in many ways, it will actually have a positive effect for many franchisees because higher minimum wages for their customers and across the economy in many states will also mean more buying power for many of their customers. I think there is a direct positive effect for them that will offset any negative cost increases. The minimum wage debate will likely pick up where it left off once the new Republican-led Congress reconvenes in January. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers. We begin tonight's market focus with Amazon and an ugly losing streak. The online retailer has lost more than a fifth of its value this year, and it's down 3 percent so far this quarter. What's even worse is that it's, it's the fourth consecutive quarterly drop for the stock, which is the first time that that's ever happened. Shares today uh, closed at $310.35, adding just 5 cents. If your New Year's celebration involves a takeout or delivery, this one's for you. Shares of online food ordering service Grubhub rose after analysts at Barrington Research upgraded the stock to outperform. They also put a $43 price target on the stock and said that the company could become a possible acquisition target. Shares rose more than 1% to 36.32.
And some bad news for Apple at the end of the year. iPad sales for 2014 are expected to decline for the first time in the tablet's five-year history. That's according to a new report. Sales are forecasted to be 68 million in 2014. That's 6 million less than the number of units sold in 2013. Shares of Apple were off about 2 percent to $110.38. Our market monitor tonight likes <clears throat> technology and financials heading into the new year. He says one of the overall themes for 2015 will be the return of growth stocks. He's Stephen Dudash, president and financial advisor at IHT Wealth Management. Steve, good to see you. Welcome tonight. Thank you, and Happy New Year. Uh, the two best performing sectors in 2014 were defensive issues, yes. utilities and health care. But you yes. see a return of growth uh, in 2015. Why? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely bullish on both, you know, the tech sector as well as the financial sector. But the return of uh, interest in the growth stocks has been really fascinating in the last few months. You know, the last few years, uh, investors have been desperate for anything paying any kind of dividend whatsoever with the yields essentially being at zero. But if interest rates do continue to increase, which a lot of people feel will happen this year, that desperation will likely start to go away. And we feel there'll be renewed interest in companies that are taking that extra earnings, putting it back into the firm, trying to hit the bottom line and trying to get outpaced returns. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, you have among the financials that you're recommending is Wells Fargo. Tell us why you like it. It's now trading at $55 a share. Yeah, again, we, and we like financials as a whole. You know, the Bank of America problem that's been going on has been well documented. They, you know, the cultural issues with Merrill Lynch, the fact the commoditization of that industry and the retention bonuses that are falling off. We feel that Wells Fargo, out of the major uh, financial wirehouses, is in the best position to pick up market share in the next few uh, say 12 to 18 months when that exodus takes place. They're the only major player out there that has both your traditional brokerage side as well as an independent channel that gives them a little unique advantage over their peers. We think they're going to outpace their predictions and, and be in a sector that's going to outpace the market as well. You also have J.P. Morgan Chase on this list. Tough year, a lot yeah. of legal issues facing yeah. them. Jamie Dimon's health. Uh, what do you see happening in 2015? Tough couple of years with them, yeah, but again, yeah. in the, you know, I mean, in the financial sector, though, as a whole, as the economy continues to pick up, if interest rates do rise, which likely second, third quarter of this year, it's finally going to start taking place, you're going to see um, a, a new flow of uh, refinances and purchases of as borrowers are coming to the realization that the extremely low interest rate market that we've been in for the last six, seven years is starting to come to an end. That on top of the fact that we're in the toughest regulatory market that we've ever seen in the new political climate, it's likely that that's going to ease up a little bit. We feel the stock is uh, at a discount right now and would likely, if you pick it up, can pick up a few extra points as well as being outperforming the overall market. You have one tech stock that you're recommending uh, tonight. It's yeah. called CDW. It trades on the uh, NASDAQ, this IT firm. Yeah. Tell us about it. Uh, why do you like it? Yeah, you know, it's a smaller, uh, it just came out in the market maybe about 12, 14 months ago, smaller uh, software hardware provider. Uh, in 08, businesses, when the recession hit, stopped spending on tech. You know, it, and the recession took not a very long time, but the recovery just seemed like it never took place. Just in the last 12 months, have you started to see businesses spending the caches that they've been hoarding, putting it back into technology as, other, as well as other sectors. We think that that sector as a whole is going to continue going into 2015, and CDW is in an excellent position to outpace their peers in a sector that should outpace the overall market. Stephen Dudash with IHT Wealth Management. Thanks, and Happy New Year. Yeah, you too. Have a nice day. And coming up next, an economic indicator to help usher in the new year. Stay tuned. Here's a New Year's Eve economic indicator, a bubbly. In bad times, people don't want to spend a lot on champagne. The opposite tends to be true when the economy is getting stronger. This year, according to champagne distributors, sales growth is up 7% year over year. That's more than double the growth of the entire wine category. So according to this, Americans are feeling better about spending and their finances. That's a good way to end the year. I agree. Well, it's not quite the way we want to end the year.
Uh, Did fa someone say bubbly? Father Time is here. Did someone oh, wow. say bubbly? Oh, <laughs> you clean up pretty good, Matheson. <laughs> Happy Congratulations. New Thank you so Happy much. New Happy Year. New Year to you. The good best. to see you both. Nice what to see you. What a nice surprise. I'm so glad you're here for the last show. The last broadcast, the last rodeo. Happy New Year, to, Happy you, New Year to, to both of you there. Great time. I'll miss Thank you so, you so much. much. Well, I'm not going I won't too miss far. you. <laughs> I, I, I'm but not, I will miss you. You're not really going anywhere. No, I'm going to be not. back but occasionally. Well, here. Here's to a great 2015. And here's to NBR. And to all of you. And, and to, hope you keep watching. To new opportunities. Story. Thank you so much. And that is Nightly Business Report for this New Year's Eve. I'm Susie Garib. Thanks for watching. And be sure, be sure to tune in tomorrow for our special 2015 Outlook Holiday Edition of NBR. I'm Bill Griffith. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, everyone. And as we go, we want you to take a look around the globe as the world rings in the new year. From all of us here at Nightly Business Report, have a happy and healthy 2015, and we'll see you in the new year. Cheers. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by TheStreet.com and Action Alerts Plus, where Jim Cramer and fellow portfolio manager Stephanie Link share their investment strategies, stock picks, and market insights. You can learn more at TheStreet.com slash NBR.